Thanks so much, Andy, um, for um, introducing me um, with the very flattering um, uh, appellation of me as a distinguished classicist. Um, and I want to thank all of you who are listening in and, and watching this webinar um, this afternoon. Um, the objectives that um, Andy, um, uh, Tamara, and, and, and Lonnie are really shepherding through with um, the aid um, of the NEH um, and, and partners are important not only in, in the context of, of our contemporary moment, but also in connection with the futures um, that we hope to build to uh, more equitable futures, uh, more racially just futures. In our time together today, I am going to focus on how to teach um, a text that I have found to be captivating um, and energizing as I center um, my teaching and uh, research work um, uh, um, on uh, questions of citizenship and civic participation and civic engagement. Uh, this is uh, a text uh, entitled The Speech in Defense of the Poet, Aulus Licinius Arceus, um, uh, by uh, the Roman um, uh, rhetorician and politician um, Cicero, Marcus Tullius Cicero. In a few moments, I'll, I'll say more um, about um, Cicero's bi biography um, and the sociocultural and political context that shape um, this text. Um, and I'll try in the course of that biographical exposition to draw attention um, to those considerations um, that were most salient um, um, for Cicero as he embarked on the task of defending um, this poet um, by the name of Archias. But by way of general introduction, I thought I would take a step back um, and um, evaluate the text, not independently or apart from um, uh, the social cultural circumstances, um, but in the context of this text reception, how it has been read um, by communities far removed um, from those communities in which this text um, was first prepared um, for delivery. And to that end, I will share a set of slides. So you'll indulge me as I do that. I entered this text um, through several roads. Um, and while I had the good fortune uh, of studying parts of this text in the course of my own professionalization uh, as a classicist, I also encountered um, this text uh, through its intermediation in the works of W.B. Du Bois, um, and specifically Souls of Black Folk, chapter four, uh, of the meaning of progress. So in this section of Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois recounts his years teaching, quote, school in the hills of Tennessee, where the broad dark veil of the Mississippi begins to roll and crumble while he was a student uh, at Fisk. And unfrequently, um, he, he states, students would come for a while uh, to his class um, and then um, stop showing up. Um, and here follows um, the quotation uh, that appears uh, on your slide. I would visit Mun Eddings, who lived in two very dirty rooms, and ask why little Eugene, whose flaming face seemed ever ablaze with the dark red hair uncombed, was absent all week, or why I missed so often the inimitable rags of Mac and Ed. Then the father who worked Colonel Wheeler's farm on shares would tell me how the crops needed the boys, and the thin, slovenly mother, whose face was pretty when washed, assured me that Eugene must mind the baby. But we'll start them again next week. When the Lawrences stopped, I knew that the doubts of the old folks about book learning had conquered again, and so toiling up the hill and getting as far into the cabin as possible, I put Cicero pro Archia Poeta, in defense of Archias the Poet, into the simplest English with local applications, and usually convinced them for a week or so. What does, this, what does putting Cicero's pro archia into the simplest English with local applications mean um, for Du Bois and for generations of folks who have read this text and tried um, to wrestle um, with um, uh, its implications? The pro archia is very celebrated um, for its um, holding up um, the practices of humanistic learning um, as a site um, for the formation and engagement um, of the citizen. Um, and in particular, it is usually discussed in connection with this ode uh, to the liberal arts um, that appears uh, in Cicero's defense of the poet. And this ode um, is also uh, on this slide. And yet, 
Let us leave aside for a moment any practical advantage that literary studies may bring. I'll say more about the practical advantages that are flagged by Cicero in a few minutes. For even if their aim were pure enjoyment and nothing else, you would still, I am sure, feel obliged to agree that no other activity of the mind could possibly have such a broadening and enlightening effect. But there is no other occupation upon earth which is so appropriate to every time and every age and every place. Reading stimulates the young and diverts the old, increases one's satisfaction when things are going well, and when they are going badly provides refuge and solace. It is a delight in the home. It can be fitted in with public life. Throughout the night on journeys in the country, it is a companion which never lets me down. So reading these words uh, as someone who um, has committed um, to a life of, of research and teaching in the humanities um, can, can be a rapturous experience. But what I want to hold out for our consideration today um, and for our rumination as we think about how to teach with this text students um, who for a variety of reasons um, will um, not accord um, significance to the humanistic project in relation to the other commitments that are necessarily and justly taking up their time, um, is what this defense of the humanity shields, um, what it conceals, what it evades. Um, I, I do want to practice um, what literary scholars would call a hermeneutics of suspicion on this text. I, I, I want to see um, if there's anything about uh, this defense of the humanities um, that should provoke a measure of disquiet um, and concern among us. I also want to use this defense of the humanities as a way um, of thinking about the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Um, and in a, in a moment, I'll attempt to differentiate um, the multiple perspectives that are advanced on citizenship uh, in Cicero's defense, uh, speech in defense of the poet Archias. Um, that we can relate um, to other strands of contemporary thinking on uh, the limits uh, and rewards of citizenship. But first I wanna offer some brief historical contextualization um, of Marcus Tullius Cicero, um, who uh, delivers um, this speech uh, in 62 uh, BCE. Uh, Cicero is a native of Arpinum um, in Italy um, and um, from uh, this town, um, which had previously produced a very high profile uh, Roman politician um, named Caius Marius. Uh, Cicero moves um, uh, on down to, to Rome um, and is established uh, at Rome um, by the 70s um, after um, spending several years um, away uh, from Italy receiving his education uh, and instruction uh, in Greece. And he quickly um, makes a name for himself as a high profile orator um, and legal advocate. Um, and he begins uh, to write uh, and, and publish prolifically, not just um, oratorical pieces such as the one um, that we're discussing today, but in time uh, works of philosophy um, uh, as well. He is also a prolific letter writer um, and uh, his letter collection, uh, uh, which um, numbers um, into uh, the 900s is an indispensable resource um, for the history um, of his world, the world um, of the late Roman Republic. In 63, uh, Cicero, um, who had steadily uh, moved uh, on up uh, the political ranks, um, what the Romans called the Corsus Honorum, um, uh, is uh, elected uh, as consul um, and in his capacity as one of the two senior most uh, magistrates um, of uh, the Roman state, um, he oversees um, the state's response uh, to a conspiracy uh, to overthrow uh, the government. Uh, Cicero himself uh, is very uh, keen uh, to praise uh, the speed with which um, he put down this conspiracy, but problems soon uh, loom on the horizon. Um, he um, has executed uh, several individuals, several high profile uh, Roman individuals um, who hold uh, the right of citizenship at Rome uh, without um, a trial and without due process. And this will land him in pretty hot water after uh, he completes his one year stint as consul at Rome. In 62, he delivers the speech uh, that we're discussing, uh, the speech in defense um, of, of the poet Aldus Sicinius Archius. This speech was delivered in defense uh, of an immigrant uh, to uh, the city of Rome, a Greek speaking poet uh, from Syria, um, who was very well connected and we'll say more in a few minutes about how significant uh, those connections are to our assessment um, of Cicero's defense of him. 
And this poet uh, faced prosecution um, after a law that was passed in 64 BC um, expelled all non-citizens um, from the city of Rome. Uh, this law was ostensibly passed to deal um, with um, uh, instances where uh, non-citizens were uh, involved uh, in seditious or violent acts or were reputed to be involved in these acts. Um, one of the difficulties in making sense of the evidence from this period and a difficulty um, uh, to which uh, many of you uh, may, uh, even if not practicing historians, be sympathetic, is the difficulty of uh, distinguishing uh, between fact and rumor um, in literary sources that seem to have a very high interest in representing uh, foreigners and representing non-Roman others as guilty of potential or actual insurrection at Rome. The intensity of anti-immigrant sentiment at Rome uh, in the final decades um, of the Roman Republic um, has received um, considerable attention recently. And Cicero is one of our sources um, for um, this sentiment. Uh, as much as he rises to the defense of a Greek-speaking poet from Syria, uh, who was held up as exceptional, um, as enjoying some of the properties uh, and attributes um, of the good citizen, Cicero in other speeches um, excoriates certain immigrant communities um, in uh, his speech in defense um, of Flaccus, uh, he uh, devotes um, various stringent um, and xenophobic uh, commentary uh, to the presence um, of Jews at Rome. Um, and so it is this ambivalent and ambiguous uh, legacy of Cicero's own uh, engagements um, with immigrants, others at Rome, um, that we have to attend to in trying to teach a text like this. It's also important for our understanding of how to uh, interpret the text as a discourse um, about um, meritocratic citizenship and about whether there are in fact uh, some immigrants who might be exempt from uh, the excoriations um, that Cicero and others keep uh, on um, the non-Roman other. And we'll have more to say about that um, in a few minutes. Not long after uh, giving um, his uh, speech in defense of Arceus, um, Cicero really does uh, find himself uh, in acute political and personal difficulties as a result of the decision he had um, made um, while serving as consul uh, to execute um, uh, men uh, without trial. And he is forced into exile. Um, he returns from exile um, after um, his major threat uh, is neutralized um, and finds that Rome has changed dramatically um, in uh, his time away. By the 50s and by the mid 50s in particular, a three person coalition has emerged at the head uh, of Rome's governance structure. Um, and this coalition, uh, consisting uh, of Julius Caesar, uh, who was consul uh, in 59, um, and of Gnaeus Pompey um, uh, and Marcus Licinius Crassus, uh, proves um, to uh, have its hands on every single aspect um, of the Roman political machinery. Following the death of Crassus on the battlefield um, in 53, uh, this three-person coalition is reduced to two. Uh, Pompey and Caesar ultimately have a falling out, uh, and a civil war erupts at the start of the next decade. Uh, Cicero himself is hesitant at first um, uh, to commit himself uh, to Pompey and Caesar. Um, he miscalculates in the end, um, and as a result of his miscalculation, um, finds himself with no real influence uh, once uh, Caesar uh, dispatches the, the forces of Pompey um, and asserts um, one-person power um, at Rome. With Caesar's assassination in 44, though, Cicero briefly vaults back uh, into high-profile influence and visibility um, as a leader of a senatorial contingent. Um, but he again miscalculates, earns the wrath of one of the three um, who uh, uh, is in charge um, of um, uh, Roman politics um, in uh, the aftermath of Caesar's assassination. Um, and as a result of earning the wrath of Mark Antony, uh, he is ultimately uh, executed. Uh, he is killed in the pres prescriptions that are unleashed uh, in 43. This biographical background um, is intended to situate um, Cicero as, as, a, as a high profile politician um, and mover and shaker uh, in the Rome of his time. But what I want to stress by accentuating these various stages in Cicero's own uh, political progression 
um, is that this was a world that was rapidly moving um, from a state of affairs that could be called Republican in nature, a form of government um, that had evolved over the course of the preceding centuries uh, to feature uh, some distribution of power, um, some um, broadly um, uh, uh, distributed um, a a responsibilities um, across uh, an elite um, aristocracy that prided itself on holding high political office and a populace um, that elected um, uh, those elites into office. All of this uh, was giving way steadily um, to a system of power that would be defined um, uh, by uh, the time um, of Julius Caesar in the 40s, and then certainly by the time of his uh, chosen uh, successor, um, Octavian, um, who would uh, ascend ultimately uh, to one person rule of the Roman state um, in 31 and 30 BCE. Uh, as a system that would um, be, um, for all intents and purposes, monarchical um, in nature. In the course of his defense of the poet Archias, um, Cicero attempts to provide several justifications uh, for why this poet in particular um, is so meaningful and so important uh, to him. And one of these justifications is relevant um, to uh, the project of making sense of the speech in a 21st century context um, that I'll uh, go into more detail about um, in a moment. Here is uh, the, the relevant text. You will no doubt be asking me, Gratius, Cicero states, why I feel such an affection for this man. The answer is that he provides my mind with refreshment after this din of the courts. He soothes my ears to rest when they are wearied by angry disputes. How could I find material, do you suppose, for the speeches I make every day on such a variety of subjects, unless I steeped my mind in learning? How could I endure the constant strains if I could not distract myself from them by this means? Yes, I confess I am devoted to the study of literature. If people have buried themselves in books, if they have used nothing they have read for the benefit of their fellow men, if they have never displayed the fruits of such reading before the public eye, well, let them by all means be ashamed of the occupation. But why, gentlemen, should I feel any shame, seeing that not once throughout all these years have I allowed myself to be prevented from helping any man in the hour of his need, because I wanted a rest, or because I was eager to pursue my own pleasures, or even because I needed a sleep? What on its face presents itself uh, as a, a pretty moving and spirited um, justification of Cicero's uh, dependence on and interest in um, uh, the poet Archias on closer examination can yield several possibilities, which will transition us um, into the thematic strains um, that I want to pick up on uh, for the remainder of our time. The first is the instrumentalization um, of the artist um, and, and of the figure um, of the humanistic learning as embodied um, by Archias. Uh, why is Archias important to Cicero? Well, because he provides refreshment uh, to Cicero um, as, a, as an artist. Um, as a writer, um, he is a source um, for Cicero's delectation and replenishment. It's not entirely one directional exploitation. Um, after all, as Cicero will go on to explain, uh, there are plenty of other reasons why, um, independently um, of Archias's own contribution to Cicero's education, uh, the Roman state might consider valuing a figure like uh, uh, the poet Archias. Uh, but the other dimension to this, the second aspect of this passage uh, that I want to underline uh, is Cicero's conviction uh, that he should, is exempt from criticism um, for indulging um, in his humanistic um, uh, exploits because he is not using his humanistic um, undertakings as an excuse to shy away from uh, political and civic involvement, uh, engagement in the courts, for example, or participation um, in uh, the, the, the rough and tumble world of Roman politics. Rather, he's using humanistic education um, in the context um, of his practice of politics. And this will get us to one of the more important themes that I propose to pick up on uh, for the remainder of our time together. In making sense of the pro archia um, and of Cicero's own defense of the humanities um, in the course of defending the claim to citizenship made uh, by um, the artist and poet um, Archias. I kept 
coming back to a passage um, from a novel that proved tremendously influential in my own formation, um, a passage um, from um, the, the foreword um, uh, to this novel. Uh, the novel is Invisible Man, uh, and in the foreword attempting uh, to justify um, his own understanding of the relationship uh, between fiction, the arts, um, and the democratic project, Ralph Ellison writes, and I quote him, um, as you see the text quoted on your slide, I felt that one of the ever-present challenges facing the American novelist was that of endowing his inarticulate character, scenes, and social processes with eloquence. For it is by such attempts that he fulfills his social responsibility as an American artist. Here it would seem that the interests of art and democracy converge with the development of conscious articulate citizens an established goal of this democratic society and the creation of conscious articulate characters indispensable to the creation of resonant compositional centers through which an organic consistency can be achieved in the fashion of fictional forms. So I love picking apart um, the, the final sentence, the final long uh, sentence um, with all of its Ciceronian uh, involutions um, uh, uh, that I've quoted um, on this slide. But for our purposes, it will perhaps be best to focus um, on one of the claims that Ellison spells out here um, that has uh, many resonances um, with and intersections with um, the kinds uh, of models of artistic and humanistic practice that as laid out in Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk, harken back to texts such as Cicero's Pro Archeo. This is fundamentally a question of whether the artist has a social responsibility um, and how we understand that social responsibility uh, um, uh, to take shape and evolve um, in direct dialogue with the practice of the arts. This is a claim that we can extend outside um, of, of the fictional arts to encompass a broad away, array of humanistic um, pursuits and liberal arts pursuits. Um, and it is here that I propose to dwell um, for the remainder of our time together. As I see it, there are several approaches available to us um, in thinking about um, the usefulness um, of pro archia um, for um, liberal arts education in the contemporary moment. Uh, the pro archia can be held up um, as a defense of humanistic learning and in particular of humanistic learning for the engaged politician. This goes back uh, to the passage um, uh, from the speech uh, that I read just a moment ago. The pro archia can also be uh, mobilized in defense um, of meritocratic citizenship for the good immigrant. And I am at, at, at pains to put good immigrants in quotation marks here uh, because one of the issues that we see playing out um, in the speech itself is how uh, Cicero develops and calibrates an understanding um, of Archeus um, as, as being better um, than other immigrants. The pro archia can also be tapped um, for a defense of multiple citizenships. Here I'll note um, uh, two um, uh, factors, one specific to the person of Archeus himself and the second more relevant uh, to um, uh, the broader social cultural formations um, in which Archeus's own life takes shape. The first is that Archeus is attempting to claim uh, Roman citizenship, was attempting to defend a claim to Roman citizenship because he holds citizenship in a community that had been welcomed into the Roman citizenship. In other words, he already holds a citizenship um, in the community of Heraclea um, in Southern Italy and he is relying on that claim of citizenship to make a claim uh, for Roman citizenship. But it turns out that this claim is not fully intelligible unless we understand uh, the broader social, cultural, and political context um, that defined um, the relationship of this community um, south of, uh, of Rome uh, to uh, Rome itself. Um, and here I'll simply note that one of the most contentious issues playing out in the course of Cicero's lifetime uh, was the extension of Roman citizenship to all communities in the Italian peninsula as a consequence of the social war uh, of 90 to 88 BCE. But Archias and Cicero also make use of another defense. Um, and this one uh, is particularly um, charged with implications um, that um, I found to be uh, very useful in seminar discussions. Um, the pro Archia attempts to defend Archias' um, citizenship uh, by referring to his praxis of citizenship. Uh, Archias does the things, according to Cicero, that constitute a Roman citizen um, already, um, whether or not 
um, the, the the court um, and, and and the jury charged uh, with hearing this case um, are willing to grant uh, to him the formal label of Roman citizen. We'll say uh, a few more words in a moment um, about what this practice of citizenship looks like, um, how citizenship is realized in the doing independently um, of any um, formal titulature of citizenship. The final point I'll make, um, as laid out on this slide, um, is that we can take the proarchia um, to be a defense of those arts, those liberal uh, arts in particular, um, that seek to praise and elevate uh, the civic community in some way. Um, and those of you who have read the text will note that Cicero um, takes special care to highlight um, the extent to which uh, Arceus's own um, artistic production uh, has centered on extolling um, uh, the virtues and accomplishments uh, of the Roman state, um, what the Romans uh, would refer to as the race gestae, um, the, uh, uh, the things accomplished or done uh, by the Roman state. This introduces some unsettling questions, and it is now um, as we wrap up with laying out um, these thematic axes um, that I will be moving to um, some unsettling questions that rise to the surface um, of a careful reading um, of the Proarchia. One of the questions concerns um, the nature of the arts um, uh, relationship um, to um, the praise of the civic community. Would we accord, would we be interested in, would Cicero be interested in um, according the same kind um, of, of protection um, to arts and to practitioners of those arts that are critical of the civic community. Uh, but here we now enter into a, a, a domain of contestation um, that is, I have found helpful for those students who are particularly keen um, to work through um, their own incipient sense of responsibility um, as practitioners of creative arts in particular uh, to um, the work um, of social justice and to projects of social justice. To what extent are those projects going uh, to receive um, the buy-in uh, that they merit and they deserve um, if they move quickly um, from this sort of praise and, and, and laudatory rhetoric um, that Cicero um, associates with the figure of Arceus uh, to out-and-out -out criticism of the many deficits um, uh, of the civic community um, in its contemporary or contemporaneous form. This is a question that I find uniquely difficult to answer on, on, on my end, um, and it's a question that I spend a great deal of time thinking uh, with and through. Also relevant here, um, and relevant in particular um, uh, to the second uh, and, and third uh, thematic points uh, uh, raised uh, on this slide, um, is the role of documentation uh, and the importance of documenting uh, the contributions of members um, of, the, of the community. Cicero argues um, that um, Arceus's claim uh, to the label of what we might call the good immigrant um, has much to do uh, with the, the, the tangible output um, of um, his um, uh, literary um, uh, endeavors over the years. Uh, in particular, the poems that he's written um, that extol uh, the accomplishments of the Roman state, as I mentioned earlier. How legible do the accomplishments of these artists and intellectuals have to be um, to other members of the community? Um, how tangible do these outputs um, have to be for their um, for those responsible for those outputs um, to be recognized um, as, as contributors um, to the civic community. And connected to this, um, and bearing on the question of citizenship as a praxis, um, what does it mean uh, to um, categorize uh, the good immigrant um, as someone uh, whose access to the rights and prerogatives of citizenship will be conditional on um, their capacity uh, to generate um, more and more uh, uh, material for the community. In other words, is citizenship and is the bestowal of citizenship along the lines that Cicero imagines a fundamentally extractive process? Are we to look at um, the good immigrants as good only as long uh, as uh, they generate or contribute something of value to the community, a value that is defined along criteria that are extrinsic to the value system of the immigrants themselves? With that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen um, so that we can move towards uh, my wrapping up of comments and my taking um, of your questions. 
I want to spend the final few minutes um, thinking in particular um, about uh, two points uh, that I raised earlier. Um, the first um, is uh, this business um, of um, multiple citizenships, um, and the second um, is uh, the overarching question um, of citizenship as qualification. Um, citizenship as something to which um, only those um, who are qualified um, should aspire. On the multiple citizenships point, um, I, I am fond of quoting uh, to students uh, a line um, from one of my favorite hip hop artists, uh, Jay-Z, in which Jay-Z brags, I got five passports and I'm never going to jail. Uh, but the question that this verse raises for me is whether the holder of multiple citizenships as um, envisioned um, and identified not only in uh, the work of Cicero, but in the work um, of others who have theorized responsibilities um, that accrue uh, to the holder of citizenship. Um, is this holder of multiple citizenship seeking to buffer themselves from policing by or conforming to the rules of any one country? Do we eye people with multiple national allegiances warily? Um, do they incite suspicion? So the Greece Israel seems to have been trying to hedge against the suspicion um, by focusing very narrowly on the question of what Archias um, had done. Um, not just um, for the Roman community at large, but for specific members of the Roman community um, in particular. But this, of course, now gets us to the issue of qualification um, and how citizenship is arbitrated um, according um, to qualifications. One of the questions uh, that I uh, charge students with thinking through um, is whether the uh, speech in defense of the poet Archias lays out any concrete criteria um, for um, the aspirant um, to citizenship, and whether we should be troubled or disquieted by um, the absence um, of any uh, concrete criteria. This kind of exercise um, can be pursued fruitfully if students are uh, motivated to um, uh, scrutinize carefully um, the existence of criteria in contemporary um, uh, immigration uh, systems and protocols, um, including, but not uh, including, but not only uh, restricted to those of the United States, um, in which there are expectations for what the immigrant is expected to know and what the immigrant um, is expected to do if they are um, to be welcomed into the civic ranks um, of that community. Citizenship as praxis in Cicero's speech um, is defined quite narrowly. Um, as it turns out, Archias isn't only engaged in uh, the uh, uh, literary outputs that I referenced earlier, literary outputs that include poems uh, that praise um, uh, the military accomplishments of Rome. He is also engaged in a series of acts that in Cicero's eyes are constitutive of um, the citizen. Um, these acts include, among other things, um, Archias's receipt of property from other Roman citizens and his drafting a will. And you'll note here that the emphasis placed on participation uh, in the uh, exchange of, of wealth and assets um, and uh, Archias's investment in um, a system um, that regulates um, the, the transfer um, uh, of, of, of property um, is an emphasis not at all uh, dissimilar to contemporary preoccupations um, uh, about uh, the immigrants' um, capacity uh, to participate in the economic system, either by the forms um, of their labor or crucially by the forms um, of uh, their ability to contribute to um, taxation um, and the responsibility to pay taxes. These are all issues um, that tie up um, to um, the, 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 the business of qualification and how qualification is arbitrated and mediated. But they also bring me um, to the final set of points um, that I wanna raise um, for our conversation um, over the Q&A. Uh, the first point is simply um, whether um, the representation um, of citizenship um, in Cicero's text offers um, those of us thinking um, about citizenship in the 21st century context some useful conceptual tools. Uh, my, my short answer to this is yes. Um, I, I, I think it does. Um, if, if, if I had been utterly despondent um, about this or had answered this question in the negative, I probably would not have chosen this text for today. Uh, but there are some problems um, with Cicero's exposition um, of citizenship um, that uh, we um, need to uh, address carefully. Uh, and I see that one 
of the people, um, uh, Donald Bushman, um, who has just answered a question uh, in the chat, has anticipated um, uh, one of the concerns that I found myself um, contending with um, as I teach this text. This text is dependent um, for its, its reception and interpretation crucially on uh, the situatedness of the reader. Um, and here, there are a couple of ways of understanding um, that situatedness. Um, the first concerns contemporary experiences of immigration and how they inform uh, the, um, uh, the, the knowledge, embodied knowledge um, that students bring um, to bear on this text. Um, I, I have found uh, myself um, as an immigrant that I, I respond uh, very powerfully and often negatively uh, to aspects um, of uh, the proarchia and, and the same can be said um, uh, for uh, those students I've taught who have engaged with this text from the vantage point um, of their own immigrant knowledges and experiences. But related to this is um, the, the question that hovers in the background of, of, of teaching texts like these and teaching a text um, from the Ciceronian corpus in particular, um, how we understand uh, the authority of, 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 of these texts, the authoritativeness of figures like Cicero, when we think about um, designing um, curricula and teaching modules that encourage students um, to question authority um, and not um, to assume uh, that just because a text is branded with the name of Cicero, that, that makes it um, uh, uniquely um, uh, powerful over their own capacity uh, to think creatively and nimbly um, about issues such as citizenship. This is what one of you in the chat just now um, uh, has flagged um, uh, with the following observation, and I'll just read it out loud and then offer uh, my thoughts on it. Um, while most students, uh, Daniel uh, Birchhock um, has written, don't read Roman historical sources, they can have an aura of authority, especially given the history of Euro-American self-fashioning in which they have been placed for centuries. I could see a scenario in which students walk away excited about meritocratic immigrant status because it confirms their own intuitive senses of good versus bad immigrants. And you know, Cicero said so. Uh, here I, I would offer um, a couple um, of, of, of possibilities, um, both for syllabus formation and, and for the configuration um, of classroom uh, discussion. Um, one possibility is um, to teach very aggressively against this text. Um, so mindful of the degree to which these students, um, many of our students will um, come in with some uh, socialized preconception um, of these texts as having some kind of ex ante authority, um, I think it would be the responsible and necessary thing to do um, to begin teaching this text by taking Cicero down uh, a couple of pegs. Um, and here it's worthwhile to linger on aspects um, of um, Cicero, the figure and of the reception um, of Cicero um, that um, are particularly useful um, for us who are thinking about um, the um, continuous reception um, of Greek and Roman texts in projects of white supremacy. So on the one hand, as I try to draw out briefly by reference um, to Du Bois at the beginning uh, of my remarks today, there is uh, a reception history of Cicero's text um, that can be related to emancipatory projects, projects that have sought um, in uh, a variety of ways um, to work towards um, uh, um, the uh, liberation of structurally oppressed and minoritized communities, in particular those communities um, that have been victimized by uh, the entrenchment um, of anti-Black logics um, in the form of global racial capitalism. Uh, um, at the same time, uh, and this merits emphasizing, Cicero has been repeatedly weaponized in the long history um, of uh, the reception of his corpus um, as a tool of knowledge um, for um, suppression and epistemic violence. And it's therefore important that in teaching this text, we don't fall into the trap of simply revindicating Cicero um, as having some kind of mystical or charismatic authority um, that um, makes it um, possible for us um, to ascribe uh, dogmatically um, positions to him, uh, say the position uh, that the, there is such a thing as a good immigrant, um, without also at the same time seeking to question uh, the foundations and the con constitution of that authority um, across space um, and time. The other point I'll make, and now I'm going to pick up um, the questions that have been raised um, by um, Jody 
um, uh, and Matthew um, uh, in the chat, um, is that so much of this work of interpretation uh, depends on scaffolding. Um, so in order to teach this text in a way um, that students um, might, might find not, not just sort of attractive or agreeable, but, but that might sort of generate um, uh, more um, uh, critical sentiment um, and, and more of an orientation towards critique um, from them, I would suggest um, that this text uh, be paired um, with um, several publications um, from uh, the journal Adelon. Uh, Adelon is a public facing um, classics journal um, in which um, uh, uh, a, a whole spectrum of perspectives are on um, and attempts to sort of meaningfully deconstruct in accessible ways the authority um, of, of Greco Roman texts um, uh, um, have, have been wheeled out over the years. Um, I think it would be important for the purposes of scaffolding um, that students uh, read this text alongside uh, short selections um, from contemporary texts in, in political philosophy or political theory that do hammer home um, uh, the um, deficits of, of the good immigrant model um, and or that seek to critique um, how um, uh, the distinctions between the good immigrants and the bad immigrants are made um, in real time. Uh, so depending on where your students find themselves and, and how you as an educator feel situated um, uh, to um, uh, work with them on these issues, um, there are a couple of, of texts that come to mind. Uh, one is um, uh, uh, one of the chapters of, of Bonnie Honig's uh, Democracy and the Foreigner. Um, a book um, that does a great deal of, of pretty nimble thinking about how the foreigner is, is conceived and represented. Um, but it's, it is a text um, that um, has a great deal of theoretical content in need of unpacking. And you might find that instead um, of, of lingering on a text such as that, which will introduce a terminology um, and, and a range um, um, uh, of socially contingent, socially cultural, social culturally contingent issues um, that might not be folded um, uh, uh, well within the confines of your class. That a text like Randolph Bourne uh, Trans America piece, um, the Atlantic essay um, uh, from 1916, uh, that meditates quite powerfully uh, on um, the contributions um, of immigrants and that attempts to systematically um, uh, critique um, uh, the notion of the melting pot would be um, a, a useful um, addition um, uh, for your syllabus. I am going to turn uh, briefly um, at Annie's prompting um, to uh, the, the Q&A. Um, in, in, in particular, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll begin with Meg Rowland's questions, um, and uh, then I'll, I'll move um, uh, to, to John Arthos's um, uh, question. Uh, so, uh, Meg's questions are, do you provide any documents about uh, U.S. immigration policy? Um, uh, do you connect um, with Cicero's exploration of Cleopatra? And lastly, where is the bust of Cicero located um, uh, that you depict? Uh, the bust of Cicero that I depict is located in the Capitoline Museums at Rome, so this is the easiest question uh, to answer. Um, in teaching my uh, Roman Republic history class, um, I've sought uh, to, to connect um, the rhetoric that we see um, in uh, Cicero's uh, Pro Archia, um, as well as the rhetoric that we see um, in his speech um, in defense um, of Flaccus um, to um, his excoriation and demonization um, of, of figures like Cleopatra, um, trying to foreground for students uh, the extent to which um, Cicero's um, uh, rhetoric um, in defense of a specific immigrant is very compatible um, with um, an assault uh, on uh, many foreign others and with um, the effort to police the boundary line uh, between uh, Romanitas, Romanity, um, uh, and um, uh, the foreign other. Um, and finally, on the, on the issue of US immigration policy, um, in teaching this text, um, I have tried to gesture in uh, the direction of contemporary um, and uh, recent um, US immigration policy trends. Um, uh, I have been careful in some cases not um, to um, overplay this, um, not so much out of a desire to um, entertain this sort of imagined space in which 
um, my students are not affected by uh, immigration policy because my, my students are um, in many cases affected um, uh, by uh, immigration policy. Uh, but mainly because there are other resources that I find um, helpful um, um, to uh, sort of ground them um, in the long terrain arc um, of US uh, immigration policy as it relates to and um, can be constructively critiqued by uh, encounters um, uh, with classical texts. And I'll be happy to sort of lay out some of those resources um, uh, via email. There is the one specific visual um, um, resource connected to US immigration policy um, that I love to summon, especially in the teaching that I do centered on citizenship. Um, it is an 1899 cartoon published uh, in Puck um, uh, magazine um, uh, entitled School Begins. Um, and this cartoon I found to be exceptionally felicitous for students who are thinking about um, the interaction of immigration policy and racial and, uh, and, and, and global racial scripts. Um, this uh, cartoon, um, if folks Google it, um, will, uh, has been on the radar um, of um, students of um, global racial capitalism uh, for a long time now. And in fact, um, some high school students encounter this cartoon um, in US history classes. But I find it especially charged um, with possibilities um, for those of us who are trying to teach um, themes and topics that straddle the boundaries uh, between antiquity and modernity for the simple reason that among the many components of the cartoon meriting analysis is the language um, of imperialism um, and the language um, and ideology uh, of governing others until they know how to govern themselves that has some uh, firmly identifiable roots um, uh, in uh, classical uh, uh, thought um, on the construction uh, and propagation um, of empire. This is, um, John Arthur had, had, had floated uh, Karma Chavez's Beyond Citizenship um, and its questioning um, of um, the valorization of citizenship as a virtue uh, and as a resource. And so I'll um, uh, reiterate um, its utility um, uh, as a resource. Um, and Lillian Doherty asked me to repeat the title of the cartoon that I described. Um, so I'm putting that um, uh, in the chat um, right now. I'll, I'll take up um, briefly um, a couple of the questions that um, have um, come in uh, into the chat just now. Um, so uh, April Shelford um, has asked um, whether there's uh, the possibility of discussing the problem um, of the instrumentalization um, uh, of the humanities that we um, uh, often, ourselves often fall into. Um, this possibility um, is one that I think is important uh, to actively seize hold of um, in teaching texts um, like Cicero's um, uh, uh, Pro Archaea. Um, because as, 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 as April makes clear, um, even in imagining um, the, the affordances and, 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 and rewards of humanistic education, um, we, we often find ourselves um, either uh, on account um, of the pressures directed at, at the humanities and liberal arts programs um, uh, in, in university and secondary school contexts, or on account of our own professionalization, and usually um, really it's not so much an either or, um, but an and. Um, we find ourselves in situations um, where that instrumentalization becomes almost secondhand. Um, we um, re re resort to this instrumentalization in an effort to um, uh, bring uh, students into our classrooms and to sell them on, and I use the language of selling um, deliberately, um, what um, the gains of humanistic um, instruction are. But it is, I think, important um, to devote um, some time in teaching these, this text um, uh, to questions of what the purpose of education um, in um, a, 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 a humanistic context are um, and whether there are uh, justifications we can develop um, for um, uh, humanistic learning that are not instrumentalist um, in, in, in nature or in direction. Um, is there a political and uh, argument to be made, for example, um, for pleasure um, uh, as a civic project? Um, I, I make this point um, because I spend time both in uh, the Freedom and Citizenship Summer Seminar um, uh, that Tegel um, uh, supports and uh, in some of my classes on citizenship um, with uh, a text um, that uh, discusses um, 
the importance of pleasure and the pursuit of pleasure um, as a principle in education. Uh, this text is um, uh, uh, Aristotle's Politics, Book Eight. Um, uh, and while there are many issues with teaching Aristotle, uh, some of which um, I would love to cover if uh, we have another event like this and I get to teach Aristotle Politics 8, um, what I want to emphasize um, in, uh, by singling Aristotle's um, uh, politics um, as a site for this kind of work is that um, providing our students um, with resources with which they can think about um, the, the uses of the humanities in ways that are non-instrumentalizing um, and in, in ways that force them to revisit some of their foundational understandings about what it might mean uh, to um, imagine their own education um, outside of um, uh, capitalist um, uh, discourses and extractive capitalist discourses um, would be important. Um, the second question that, that April raised um, is whether there's an opportunity to discuss um, uh, why uh, citizenship. Um, and I agree with, with April here um, that this kind of question is particularly good to think with uh, in the context of globalization. Um, and it would be useful to play this question up um, in in two different directions, um, which are complementary. Um, for one, as I've uh, made a point of emphasizing to students in my citizenship classes, there is growing resistance to um, the language and the taxonomies of citizenship. Um, there, there are, in fact, multiple um, theorists of citizenship who have called on um, uh, uh, folks um, to imagine modes um, of political identification and belonging that ditch uh, the, the, the term citizen um, and replace it with others. Um, so um, Denizen is one that has enjoyed, um, uh, has gained some traction recently. Uh, but there is also, I think, and, and this answers more directly um, April's invitation, um, a desire to uh, re-examine quite carefully in the age of globalization, um, the, the frictions uh, between um, uh, local statehoods um, in the exercise um, of civic responsibility um, and uh, regional, super regional, um, international phenomena um, uh, that do not at first or second or third blush seem um, to answer um, to um, uh, civic authorities of various kinds. So here um, it, it is important to uh, acknowledge for students uh, the extent to which um, globalization and global capital um, has uh, really um, uh, played uh, havoc with understandings of citizenship as a bounded um, uh, territorial and legal thing. Um, this can be centered for them by reference um, to uh, material um, from uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans and from ancient Western Eurasia, but I mean, there are many ways of putting uh, this question on the table for them. Um, there are sites for entertaining what it might mean um, to pursue uh, a citizenship um, that ranges beyond um, uh, regional or national uh, borders as well. Um, this would be the precinct um, of some of the more recent and creative work on cosmopolitanism. And here, um, one text that I find useful to think with um, and to teach um, is Kwame Anthony Appiah's uh, Cosmopolitanism. Uh, Richard uh, Shah has asked, um, how do you teach students who consider themselves woke and therefore find critique a way of not having to think about nuance and context? In this view, Cicero is racist, Eurocentric, and imperialist, and thus has nothing um, uh, to offer. So here, um, a couple of opportunities um, I think are possible. Um, so the first has to do um, with the identities of those who are, are doing the teaching. Um, and this is why I think it's important um, for um, communities and, and, and institutions of a higher education uh, to work towards um, the diversification um, of the professoriate. Um, I think it does matter to students um, that the person uh, who teaches uh, this text and teaches a text that, as I mentioned earlier, um, is striated with and um, uh, is, is, is really intersected by um, forms um, of, of racialized um, Eurocentric control. Um, it matters to them, it may matter to them, um, and can certainly be relevant for them as they form their thoughts on the text uh, that this text is being taught um, by an Afro-Latino faculty member. Um, that, that's not to say, of course, that the success or, or failure of teaching this text 
rides entirely on the identity of the person who's doing the teaching. Um, but it is important to note um, that the practice of pedagogy, especially as it bears on texts that are tethered um, to constructions and deployments of power um, that are violently racist uh, and Eurocentric, hinges to no small degree um, on um, how that text is voiced and inhabited um, and how critiques of that text um, are voiced and inhabited uh, by uh, the, the people who are teaching them. Uh, but the other issue I would raise in connection to this is that um, how this teaching unfolds is to a large extent uh, contingent on the format um, of the class um, that you run. So I think that for students uh, to um, appreciate the nuance of a text like this and to appreciate how it, how this text can be purposed to ends other than those um, that um, uh, define its reception in racist um, and imperialist modes of domination, it can be useful, uh, as I try to do, to sort of style uh, the history um, of the text reception, particularly uh, in the hands um, of people um, like W.B. Du Bois, although one can also talk about Cicero's reception um, in the hands um, of Frederick Douglass um, as a way of thinking through the complexities um, of texts like these and of thinking through uh, the alternatives they open up um, for various um, emancipatory practices in our contemporary moment. And the final point I'll make, um, and here I'm going to try to pick up um, uh, the questions raised um, by Stephen um, uh, and Martin um, uh, in the chat, um, is that as I noted just now, if we're thinking about the configuration of the class and how that how the class um, uh, is designed around anticipating uh, the needs of the students, there are going to be some pretty significant differences um, between teaching this text um, uh, to gen ed students um, and uh, teaching it um, uh, to to majors. So the most salient one, uh, for my purposes, is that. Um, we have to be um, very uh, meticulous about um, scaffolding um, a text like this um, in a gen ed context. Um, we have to assume, uh, for one, uh, that um, this text is simply not going to appeal to students um, and that much of what will appeal to them um, is how we model, model excitement and frustration with the text um, as a way of getting them um, to uh, join us on the, on the journey um, of, of imagining uh, for themselves what this text can do for them. But for gen ed students, I think it's particularly useful to think about uh, the thematic organization uh, of, 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 of a module in which this text, of which this text forms part, um, and to really try as clearly and forthrightly as possible to anchor the text to uh, contemporary um, uh, concerns and dilemmas. And here's where playing up uh, the theme um, uh, of, of the good uh, or bad immigrant and challenging uh, Cicero's representation um, of that may be one avenue. Uh, but another avenue, um, as I gestured to some time ago, um, is uh, the status of the arts um, itself um, uh, within this text. Um, fundamentally, one of the questions that's raised um, by this text is, what is the purpose um, of, of the humanities? Why, why bother with humanistic um, instruction um, at all? That's something I think that gen ed students should be invited um, uh, to, to consider and entertain um, in their work. Um, Martin has raised the question um, of whether if the goal of this lesson is to debunk Cicero's position on immigration and citizenship, wouldn't it be easier to simply have students read a contemporary article uh, that debunks the myth of the good immigrant? Um, it, it could be easier on, on some fronts, um, but, and here I'll wrap up my presentation since I see that I'm a uh, little over two minutes um, uh, past. What is, Central, as I see it, um, in any project that seeks to um, position Cicero and, and, and Cicero's tax or, or Greek or Roman text of any stripe for that matter um, within a gen ed space, is that we get students to think about um, the genealogies of the concepts with which um, uh, they are wrestling in the contemporary moment and around which contemporary political discourses are constructed. So what I like to emphasize for students is that 
it's important in acknowledging and, and defanging or uh, completely and comprehensively debunking um, concepts such as those of the good immigrant that we recognize that these concepts have a very long history. And that long history, um, far from being some antiquarian relic, actually leaves uh, a tangible imprint on the configuration, um, political and cultural, um, of those contemporary discourses against which um, they might wish uh, to rally. So this is really a summons for them uh, to think about the relationship between the deep past of these concepts um, and their responsibilities to debunking these concepts. And to go back to one of the earlier questions, this is another site for them to begin thinking about how um, these contemporary discourses come cloaked with an authority that is often tethered um, to figures such as Cicero. Um, and it is for that reason that the contestation of this text brings them into the space of contesting that authority and ideally empowers them to think about how they can construct uh, modes um, of emancipatory uh, and liberatory discourse uh, that are no longer wedded um, uh, to um, that authority, even while they, of course, acknowledge um, that um, in uh, those contexts where these texts are being weaponized and continue to be weaponized, um, the, the, the authority held by figures such as Cicero uh, remains something uh, from which um, contemporary white supremacist groups uh, are quick to capitalize. So that's it. I am done. Thank you all uh, very much for your questions. Um, I am sad that I didn't get to address uh, Monty Johnson's question about how non-instrumental Cicero's defense of Archaeus poetry is, um, but I hope that if you're interested, you'll correspond with me, um, and thank you very much for listening.